Hello and welcome to Take the Lead Presents Virtual Happy Hour. We're glad you're here. I'm Gloria Felt, co-founder and president of Take the Lead. We host virtual happy hours on the second Wednesday of each month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We interview women who take the lead in their own lives and careers. So you have one hour once a month to boost your career. It's a quick, easy, and fun way to learn what other smart, interesting role model women are up to, too. Please tweet your questions to at Take Lead Women or type them into the chat box. We want to hear from you and we'll get those questions answered. Take the Lead's mission is nothing less than leadership gender parity by 2025. Visit www.taketheleadwomen.com to find training programs for yourself and your organization. You can also find mentoring, coaching, role model events, and great content to help you on your journey. That's www.taketheleadwomen.com. Now, make yourself comfortable. Grab a cocktail, a mocktail, tea, coffee, glass of water, whatever you like, and sit back for an inspiring virtual happy hour. Okay, so my co my world changing co host, Reshma, <laughs> hey. Reshma Gopaldas. Um, and I want to just introduce Reshma, who's going to introduce the, the other guests. Reshma is vice president for media at She Media, and she's a great friend of Take the Lead. Thank you very much for being here tonight, Reshma. A little bit more about Reshma, so you know. Uh, you know, I, I always say that the, the world turns on human connections. And uh, yeah, Reshma and I have been humanly connected for a long time since she was Associate Director of Creative Services and Talent Engagement at Planned Parenthood Federation of America when I was president. And she, she did a whole lot of video content there and managed our celebrity supporters. So she's got a great background. She's worked in film and television production. And her work has been featured all over the place on CNN, ABC, HuffPo, Decibel, Fox, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, which is, of course, always the most uh, most interesting. So, Reshma, thank you. And let me toss the ball to you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we are so excited uh, to have our two special guests tonight. The first is uh, Amy Emmerich. Uh, she's the Chief Content Officer at Refinery29, which is a leading digital lifestyle media company for women, as you all probably know. Um, she has more than 20 years of experience developing contenting and programming for brands, um, not only for Refinery, for MTV Networks, Travel Channel, and Vice Media. She's an award-winning producer, and she has a lot of production and development experience. Um, she's worked in linear television, digital video, and emerging social media. And uh, like all of us, she's committed to creating a dialogue with a powerful generation of women around topics that matter. And then, of course, we have, Amy, do you want to just say hi to everyone? Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. All right. And um, we're also honored to have Myra Lowe. Um, so I'm going to read you off some amazing Myra stats here. She's the director of the Innovation News Center at the University of Florida. College of Journalism and Communications, and the president-elect of JAWS, which stands for Journalism and Women's Sym Symposium, uh, which is a global collective of female journalists. Um, the Inc. is a multimedia newsroom of student journalists and professionals that serves North Central Florida by multiple distribution channels, including PBS, NPR, ESPN, and WFT.org. Uh, prior to joining UF, Mira was a senior editor at CNN Digital in Atlanta, and she was editor-in-chief of Jet Magazine, the first woman to helm the African-American News Weekly, and assistant managing director of Ebony at Johnson Publishing Company in Chicago. So guys, thank you both so much for taking time to uh, join all of us. And uh, Gloria, I'm going to kick it over to you. It's a question we like to ask all of our guests. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Reshma. And so the the... 
Hi, Chantal. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Maritza. I was just seeing so many friends out there. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't resist looking to see because like I said, this has never happened before. We, we're, it's usually just us on the screen. So this is so cool. All right. So, uh, so all of you out there, you need to start tweeting in your questions and letting us know what you would like to ask these incredible women. But I get to go first since nobody's asked another question. So this is, I'm going to take my turn very happily so. We have a question we like to ask everybody at the beginning because I always think that the thing that women most want to know is how did you get to be you? What's your story? What caused you to have the career that you have? What, what brought you to where you are today? And how do you do it? So Myra, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, um, uh, Rush, uh, Rushma, for inviting me to be this uh, part of this conversation. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to talk about how I became the Myra Lowe today, but, um, you know, the truth is, I would say that I'm still becoming Myra, if that makes sense, <laughs> you know. Um, um, I feel like I'm constantly trying to evolve um, and reinvent myself and stay relevant with the times. You know, I've moved my career professionally and, and personally. I've kind of tried to, to reinvent myself. I've, my career started in newspapers. I moved to magazine public, publishing. I moved then to a TV cable operation, a digital media, academia, public media, ethnic media. And so I think for me, um, how I became Myra of today is by taking chances, Ooh. by um, um, by seeking new opportunities that may not have been comfortable, um, or for me, kind of trusting my gut on, on, on making those moves. Um, I, I would say I dreamed of this career path, but it's something that I've enjoyed as I look back. It's kind of been a fun ride, and I don't know where I'm going to go next, quite frankly. You know, my journey is still, is still moving along. So I'm happy to answer any questions specifically. I don't want to go through the bio, how I started at this small paper, and then move to that thing and that thing. But overall, my journey has been one of reinvention and, and trying to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. No doubt you have done exactly that. So Amy, what about you? How did you get to be you? Still figuring out me. I love your answer. Um, I think the I've always had hustle and stamina. Um, people who work with me are, just don't understand how I can keep going. I, I don't know <laughs> either. I think um, my story is I'm from a working class family and I think that work ethic just unfortunately inside of me. And I think there's a level of curiosity um, so, you know, I, I think it is in line with your answer in a bit, that it's definitely gut instinct that taking risks, some people would say, but it's really just taking chances, um, total agreement on keeping that moving. Um, you know, always curious to see what's next, what's on the horizon, you know, innovation, um, not really, um, trying to stay with the status quo. I think I never quite fit in, so you're, I was constantly looking at, um, how to fit in in another place so that I wouldn't have to change myself to stay in one location. So I think um, hustle and stamina with a positive attitude. Hustle, hustle and stamina. That, that, that could be a great bumper sticker right there. <laughs> Mantra or something. <laughs> oh my goodness. So let's just take a quick look at the status of women in journalism. And I, I'm not going to go through all of the all of the data that's out there, as you know, there is an enormous amount of research and uh, some of the news is good and some of the news is not so good. But uh, despite the fact that women have been close to or perhaps the majority of students in journalism school for quite a long time, the American Society of News Editors reports that in uh, its latest newsroom census that the percentages of women in newsrooms hasn't changed much in the last even couple of decades, actually. Women made up more than a third of the newsroom employees in, in 1999, and it's just up to 41.7% now. So uh, not a whole lot of change there. Um, women are 
you know, almost half of daily newspaper employees. But um, but when you look at who's in the top leadership, that's not the numbers are not so great. And for people of color, the numbers are far less encouraging. About 22% of the employees reported by all newsrooms, and then the daily newspapers, it's about the same. Um, when it comes to the top titles of, of newspapers in the world, it's about 25, or excuse me, uh, women, women run three of the, of the top 25 newspaper titles in the US and only one globally, apparently, according to the Women's Media Center. And that number has actually decreased in the past 10 years. And you know, that's, that's a disturbing trend because in the Fortune 500 companies, the number of female CEOs has also declined in the last couple of years. So we're hoping that there's not a, not a trend there. So, um, uh, Rachel, do you have some other thoughts on Yeah, I, I have some matter? stats to kind of throw you You're right there in the middle of it. I know. I think we know, like, the stories we read aren't really representative of the world we, we live in. So a uh, few statistics here. Men are still the majority of storytellers across all platforms. They receive 62% of bylines and other credits in print, online, TV, wire news, and have 84% of the last century's Pulitzer Prizes, um, according to the Women's Media Center report called The Status of Women in the U.S. Media from 2017. And this is really confusing because two out of three students in journalism now are female. Um, oh, so two out of three. It's not even, okay. I was, yeah. I, was, I was on the low end in what I said, yeah. Yeah, was, two out of three. Um, so uh, Myra and Amy, what are each of you doing to ensure more women are telling the stories of our time? And I'll start with you, Myra. So, you know, the, 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 the statistic you just uh, um, um, articulated about young women in college, right? So I'm at the University of, of, of Florida, and I see that statistic every day. Yeah. Uh, the majority of, of uh, students who are in our program and who have come through my newsroom are women. So to answer that question is helping to train that next generation of women in media to have a stronger um, voice and to have a stronger um, um, presence in the media, helping them uh, have the confidence to amplify their voice and to tell the stories that matter to our communities, but also to tell stories that are representative of our communities, particularly when it comes to women, uh, women of color. Um, there's just such a need to um, reinforce that thinking and to reinforce um, this idea that you can do this uh, and you do not have to be afraid to do it well. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is, um, as a former recruiter, uh, I think there's a lot of talk right now about equity and inclusion and, and media and newsrooms and companies, but it's really about putting um, action behind that talk. And so as a, as a recruiter, you know, my thing has always been proactively, we need to proactively cultivate talent. We need to proactively recruit. And the third, the second R is proactively retain. That retention piece is so important as, you, as we're seeing maybe more women leaving the, the, the industry of the newsroom. Why is that the case? And how can we keep them engaged? How can we give them opportunities to grow? How can we advance them up the ladder? So that's a long answer to your question about what I'm doing, but really trying to help prepare that next generation to really move in a more uh, proactive, forceful way. Uh, Myra, someone just asked, why do you think women are leaving the newsroom? And uh, just to add on to what you were saying, I think in my experience working in media, you know, I spent the first half of my career, uh, really, I didn't feel like I should have a voice. I felt like I should always wait for people to tell me what to do. And in training this new generation of female video producers and everything, I find that I have to unlearn a lot of what we were taught growing up. Um, which is you should have a voice, you should feel heard. So one of the reasons I think people, um, at least in my industry, are leaving jobs is because they stop being heard by people and they don't feel like they can make change. Um, but I Absolutely. love your, your take. Absolutely. Um, you know, this idea of um, not feeling valued uh, 
not, um, to your point, not being heard, not being given the opportunities to, to get the great assignments or to, or to lead a team or to, um, um, to tell the stories that matter to them and to those who they believe will be interested in these stories, right? I mean, there's a lot of conversation about um, uh, work-life balance and, and all of that, but I think at the end of the day, it's really about providing opportunities for, stu for, for women in the workplace that are meaningful and that are, are um, that are opportunities for growth and advancement. I mean, at the end of the day, we all want to grow. We all we don't want to be static. And so, how do we do that? And I think that's really a, needs to be a commitment from the top of the organization, and let that funnel on down. That's a great answer. And um, we'll get we'll get into a lot of your questions coming in. But Amy, I'd love to know from you, like, what are you doing at Refinery to to kind of change the change the status quo and change this view? I mean, th th this place has really taught me to be unapologetically for women. And there, there's no other better way to say that. Since I, I got here, I didn't even understand the world I was living in before to truly, I think, you know, growth comes with many levels for people. And for me, I'm always, I'm looking to constantly learn. As a, as a human and as a brand, how am I evolving? Is there time for me to get educated? And I just feel like working here allows you to do that in many ways, just because of the diversity of voices that we have working here and what we can learn from one another, never mind from our audience. Um, but even as I have grown and have had to do panels or speaking like this, even over the four years, because consistency around women representation in media and um, the inclusion all women of all kind represented and being able to stick to that message as far as what we do as a brand. And I think that's for what we do internally as well as externally. Um, education is just a big part to your point, Gresham, of like unlearning and, and having to train ourselves um, how to ask for more. What should we do with that? It's very interesting time of, you know, you want to empower everyone. I always say not everyone's going to get more, but you first have to even learn how to ask for it. Um, and it's okay if, as our business may not, you know, be able to provide, but no matter where you go, you want the skill set to be able to ask um, and have those conversations. And, and, and even the way new digital media is built, you're just not around uh, um, the same kind of large scale tables with a large, you know, experienced people of over 40 years where you're kind of watching and learning. So this is much more self-taught from one another, what they're getting out of each other and what we can provide to them. But to your point, it's all new. It's, it's new way of thinking. So yeah. you've got to just make sure that there's room for them to have that. Um, whether we have policy around our hiring process. Um, I think a lot of people are leaving the newsroom just because of even family friendly environments. Um, we've had a lot of opportunity for women to start to grow and learn and start off early in journalism and everyone's dropping out around family age. Like we haven't really changed culture of the work environment to establish for an easier way um, forward for, for women. And I think that's what just starts to get too difficult. I've got, we've got a bunch of questions coming in here. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna, I wanna hop over here to questions. And, and by the way, Amy, I'm from the oil com oil country in Texas. What in the heck? How did Refinery Twenty Nine get to be the name of your <laughs> media outlet? I have been wondering that forever. There, um, you know, the the brand was built over fourteen years ago by four really good friends um, in Brooklyn, and at the time they were refining shopping options in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, back when oh, yeah. true artisans were getting started, the internet was just, you know, kind of hitting. They built basically like a, an electronic mall of where to go, but it was really helpful because it was not only refining choices, but it was really endorsing new voices and new brands um, that were just getting started in the industry. Oh, so well, it started off with 29. In my mind of, of a, you know, like of a refinery with like, you I know, know, it is yeah, nothing to do. Okay. I, I do feel like we've grown into the name because also of what a refinery does is take the voice, like what you could do is refine something and, and then share it out into right. the world in a larger way. And I feel like we do that with a lot of craftsmen and new voices, but yeah, not oil, nothing to do with oil. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Here is a question from Twitter. 
thank you for hosting this awesome talk. All right. What are the benefits of a young journalist working first at a legacy media outlet versus at a more inclusive or innovative outlet? Would you advise a student, advise a student journalist to work at one over the other, considering the lack of diversity in most newsrooms uh, from Diara, Diara J. Who wants to take that? Either one, jump in. Hmm. Um, I, I, I'll jump in on that. Uh, Amy, I'm curious to hear your opinion on that as well. I don't know if one is better than the other. I mean, uh, you, there, there may be a better opportunity at the legacy um, operation versus the startup. So it just really depends on, I think uh, Amy hits the right word when she says culture. Like, what is the culture that you want to be in? What um, aligns with your values as a person and as a journalist or as a media professional? And that's how you decide, I think, um, whether you go to a legacy or whether you go to a startup or a more digital focused operation. It's really about what do they have to offer? What's the culture there? Do you feel like you're a good fit for that culture? And what are the values that you um, are, want to align with in that particular operation? Uh, you know, getting the experience is going to be important. And we talk to our students all the time about making sure you get the best possible opportunity coming out of college, and taking, again, some risk and not being a tunnel vision and where you might want to go, but really keeping uh, your mind open to where you might go. A lot of students want to go to the big city right away or, you know, go to New York or go to LA, but there may be some other really promising growth opportunities elsewhere. So advising them to keep their options open and to weigh all the opportunities and not just take one over the other just because. Yeah, you know, I, I actually agree with you. I don't think there's a right answer. I think it also, you've got to look at not only the culture of the brand, but what brand or type of news are those two things covering, which legacy, which new media, and then the life cycle that they are in themselves, which sounds odd, but, you know, CBS right now might be awesome. CBS last year, maybe not. <laughs> so, Good point. Good point, Amy. Yeah, great. Things, things do change quickly, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. All right, great. Well, um, so we have qu questions from Kirsten and Tamika that I'm going to take right after this. But um, I wanted to say for anybody who has tuned in late, and there are a few people who've joined us a little bit later in the game, that you're watching Take the Lead's first virtual happy hour of the month. And we're so delighted that you're here, co-hosted with, with uh, Reshma Gopaldas and myself. I'm Gloria Felt, co-founder and president of Take the Lead. And our amazing guests tonight are Amy Emmerich, who is the Chief Content Officer at Refinery29, and we just found out what, what that name came from, and, um, <laughs> and also Myra Lowe, who, among many other things, is President-Elect of the Journalism and Women's Symposium, which is a very important uh, uh, organization of female journalists across the country. So welcome, and we're, we're, we're anybody who's coming later, and we're really glad that you're here. Um, I, oh, I just also want to just mention, I mentioned that we had two downloads for you and they are now both in the chat box. So you can go to the chat box anytime you want to. And for those who, um, who signed up for the webinar but couldn't be here this evening, we will be sending these out to you as well. Um, and one of them is an exercise from our leadership power tool number eight, employ every medium that will help you assess your own consumption of media and how it affects you as a leader and how you can be a thought leader and be the media. And the other is a, um, an interesting research paper on the impact of media on our perceptions of ourselves as women leaders um, or, or not. Uh, so yeah, we really believe, I really believe that each one of us can be the media and that we can use our personal, our social and traditional media pretty much every step of the way that we can we can use the power of our voice. We all have the power of our voice and there are many ways that we can use it. So be sure you download those two things. And uh, if you're in Arizona, click on the link for the 50 Women Can Change the World and Nonprofits Program. And we also include other kinds of community service like uh, government and education. So if you have an interest in that immersive program, click on that. 
last call to apply. So do it now, don't delay. And you can hop on over to our website, takethelead.women.com every day uh, to find free resources and access to all of our Breakthrough Women's Leadership programs. Oh, okay. Oh, we have more questions coming in. All right. Um, so Kirsten wants to know, does Refinery29 get support from philanthropy for its work? And she also had a comment uh, earlier, uh, basically we need more money to pay women journalists. Uh, acknowledging that that wasn't a question, but a statement worth sharing, comment worth sharing. So, um, so since the question is about yeah. Refinery Twenty Nine, Amy, why don't you why don't you take that one? I feel like we need, we need more women to we need more money to pay women. Period. 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 Yes. Let's close that pay gap while we're closing. I never the find right? I never find it like a professionalism that's like, wow, that one pays women well. <laughs> Even the ones that are over indexed on women, teachers, <laughs> they're not making any extra money. So we got a problem across the board. Um, and I just find even as a female-led business in a patriarchal capitalist society where most businesses are run by men, within that old thinking is even harder. Um, it, you know, because we believe in that, it doesn't set us up higher. It's like us fighting a larger um, system. So yeah, I think that that, that statement is correct. Um, what, what, the, other, the other part of, the, of uh, Kirsten's question was, does Refinery29 get philanthropic support? We, we don't. If anything, we, we do a lot of like put our mission where our, put your, you know, our mission is for to be a catalyst for women to feel something in their power, but we put our money where our mouth is, is what we say. So a large part of our content is about raising awareness around other people's nonprofits. We work alongside Planned Parenthood um, quite a bit. We just worked with ACLU, GLAD, um, and then even some smaller um, organizations that are trying to change policy. So we do a lot of content and work with them and partner there, but we don't um, pull a therapy or, or grants. We're, we're straight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, from Julie. Julie wants to know, oh, wait, um, Ellen. Oh, you know, Julie and Ellen, wait. Oh my goodness, all these questions are tied together. I'm gonna start with Julie here. Do you think empowering slash encouraging men to be stay-at-home dads and our caregivers would help open more opportunities for women to stay in the workplace, even during their childbearing years? And how do we keep men from becoming paranoid about working with women in this Me Too era? Mm. Well, there's, there's two big questions. Those let's are huge questions. With, let's, let's start with, <laughs> well, actually, yeah. let's just, I think we're just taking on the role of men in general in yes. today world of work and family so um amy it looks like you were you had something you wanted to say so why don't we start i mean I'm, I'm very lucky my husband is part-time stay-at-home dad and i think it was really tough for me to have to face what he was even dealing with because it wasn't a societal norm for him to deal with that but watching him himself have to realize wow he's had to change what he was told he needed to be which was a struggle so by all of us encouraging men to be stay-at-home dads it helps everyone out, every working unit, um, no matter how that phase is. I think it's more about getting the corporations to understand what that looks like and that it's not about gender, but it's just about supporting family as a whole and what that could be. That's a good point. Yeah. Myra, want to add yeah. to that? I, I agree. It's, um, uh, we need to uh, have our cultures, our companies and their cultures make it okay to have these conversations. One about uh, women and men in the workplace. I don't think women, men need to be paranoid about working with women. I mean, I just think, you know, um, we're all professional. We all should act professional. We should also treat each other professional. We should all respect, e we should all respect each other. So this idea that women, men need to be paranoid now is absurd to me. But, um, but it, it comes back to this creating a culture of of, of valuing people in the workplace, men, women, families, lives that we live, right? Our lived experience should have some value to our employers. And so having different arrangements for to care for our family should be part of the conversation and should be consideration for any employer who wants to keep good people. I mean, I think that should be a part of the conversation. If you want to keep good talent, how can you make the environment so that they want to stay? And how can you help work with them and their family situations to do so? 
No, absolutely. There's an education level here too, right? I think we, we used to live in a world where everyone ran to lawyers and now we've all got to open ourselves up and hopefully you can create a culture of trust that if someone does do something that you can it, it, like confront it immediately. Hey, I'm very uncomfortable with how you're speaking or I'm uncomfortable with what you're doing. And that everyone needs to understand that that needs to be the culture now. We have to educate one another, especially within a certain bracket. Um, but to your point, Mira, if you don't create the culture of that at the office in the first place, then you've got a larger problem. Yeah, yeah. and, then, and, and yeah, just to ahead. add, oh, sorry, Myra, were you, were you saying something? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to add to that to say, you know, getting back to um, encouraging men to stay home. I think it's more um, creating a work culture where, you know, let's, things are not changing super, super fast. I mean, I've worked in some offices, uh, thankfully not my current company, where people kind of look down upon uh, men taking parental leave. Oh, what does he need to be doing that? If your company doesn't support parent the parental leave for men, then you are saying to your employees, women should be raising children. So mm -hmm. it's changing that culture, creating this culture of respect um, where men will feel comfortable and not um, feel like people are gonna be making fun of them. And where women can also feel like, oh, I'm valued as not just the caretaker of children, but also, you know, someone who, who can work. Um, and I do think we have a lot of work to do. Um, Myra, I think you alluded to this before, um, or Amy, uh, you know, just making the workplace somewhere where women can have children and also work, because we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, the, the thing is that we are still operating for the most part in institutions that were designed by men, yes. for men, who had the women at home taking care of the house and, and, and all the caregiving that needed to be done, whether for the young or for the old. Yeah. And they're, they're honestly, it's just not functional in today's world. It's not only not a good thing for, for women, it's not a good thing for men either anymore. It doesn't work, for, I think it doesn't work for anybody anymore because the world has changed so much. And I, 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 when I work with younger men, they so much more want to be a part of their children's lives and they're often afraid to, you know, they're often yeah. afraid to, they're afraid they're going to be looked down on mm -hmm. if they take time off or if they're a stay at home dad or whatever. So it's a, you know, it's a culture change and the change is always a little difficult for people, but it's also very necessary. And, and I think it's a really great yeasty, yeasty time. And I'll tell you, I got to throw this one thing and I don't mean to be flipping about this, but the question about, about men being paranoid uh, <laughs> how to, i'm gonna you know like what did we learn in kindergarten about how to be nice to each other how hard is that right. just think about that that's all we need to do is just like remember right. what yeah. did we learn in kindergarten about what to do okay i got there's a big question here that i that i want to ask um because ellen asked it and also chantal asked about ageism in the workplace um, so Ellen specifically wanted to know, is everybody in this conversation aware of diversity, also, that diversity also includes women over 60? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, um, and Chantal just, just generally wanted to talk about ageism. It's often women do take time out for caregiving of various kinds. And then we hop back into our careers and sometimes we're older when we do that. How do you see the workplace today and as it's evolving for women uh, of, of a certain age, shall we say? Well, go ahead, Amy, go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. No, no. Go ahead. I, was gonna say, uh, I think this goes back to the earlier point of why women are leaving the newsroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I think older women are also leaving the newsroom because of ageism. Yeah. Um, a lot of companies are, are seeking to go with younger employees for, for a variety of reasons, right? It could be because of, um, um, they're cheaper to employ, you know, um, or, or um, they have the digital skills oh, yeah. that um, um, so-called older women or might not have. And I just think that's bogus um, <laughs> uh, excuses, right? I mean, Women who are in the newsroom who may be over 40, over 50, in their 60s, I, I, I come back to this idea of value. And they bring value to a newsroom based on their experience, the 
so many of them have the institutional knowledge. Many of them are willing and are able to uh, take on the digital um, skills that are needed. It's not that they don't want to. It's not that they can't. It's about giving them the opportunity if they choose or want to do those roles. And I think we have to think more broadly and more openly about what we think women can do at any age in any workplace. And so it's, it's an ageism is real, and I, I'm hoping that we can address this um, issue as we talk about equity in newsrooms across all age groups. Yes, Meyer, that's such a good point. And another thing we also have to do um, is teach our younger employees to value um, old, you know, older colleagues. Uh, I just had something happen the other day where someone was expressing frustration that they reported to someone who couldn't even open, open a PDF. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure your parents didn't love it when you couldn't walk. You know what I mean? Like we can <laughs> we can teach each other things. She Absolutely. might not be able to open a PDF, but she can tell you the twenty year history she's had in media, and like teach you things that I grew up with. Like my grandmother helped raise me, so I saw my parents aging at different rates, and you know how they needed help in the same way that we all needed help when we're first starting out. Mm -hmm. So it's teaching that younger generation. The goal is like I look like I'm 28, but I'm actually not because my magic brown skin. So I hear a lot from the young, the young people at our office who are, who are frustrated. Um, but I, I try and tell them, you know, you need to focus on what you can learn from them if, instead of getting so frustrated that they can't open a PDF or figure out this email, help them out because they're going to help you out. I mean, I, I totally agree. Ageism is real. You know, look, I, I work where the probably average, it's 86% women and average age is probably 34. There's like an executive suite where I think the oldest person might be 50. Um, I'm 43. I talk about age all the time. We currently just entered into a partnership with AARP, AARP, about uh -huh. ageism. So their uh -huh. new campaign was really about changing the face of ageism. And they did a Getty partnership and really did an amazing job. Um, and I'm always about representation. What it is that you see is what you will be. And first you have to change what we even think a 50, 60, 70 year old looks like. Um, and they were doing that. And we did a study with our audience, probably about 18 to 34. And the truth is ageism actually hits at any age because a lot of the younger people we hear, you're too young to possibly do that. You know, there's no way you could run a business. But with the entrepreneur spirit, there's a lot of young people who are very successful. And what we saw with the high school last year in gun reform, I mean, they, were, they managed to do something in a movement that many people before had it. And some would yep. say you were too young to do that. So we're trying to bridge the gap of ageism and how it hits an older set as well as a younger set. Because what we all need to do is shift our culture and our language around how we even say the most natural thing, like, wow, you look so young in that outfit. Like, what the hell does that mean? Why am I saying that? Or does this make me look old? It's like, well, why are we using these words to mean negative yeah. things? And that's because how they've been presented back to us for so long. So uh, we're, we're really big believe in trying to even just start this conversation openly and, and take a look at how we're getting treated. I do think the Golden Globes was an awesome night for women over the age of 50. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I was like, this is a great step forward. Glenn Close getting that big one. Trump and Carol, Gaga. Like, Carol it, Burnett. Um, Carol right. Burnett. You know, a lot of people do. You wouldn't know the age. Nicole Kidman. Over, like, many people over the age of 50, but you wouldn't even admit it because what we assume over 50 looks like. We still have this image of like 19. Look like, dress like, act like, you know, all those things, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and we need to wipe it out. You know, we've got to like reset. Age is just this number. We should be able to own our age and, yep. and like not be shy to talk about it. And I think that will start to then push change in the workplace. I don't think it's going to start in the workplace. Well, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, we, we know that diversity in general around the table enables organizations to have a, a richness of ideas and better perspectives and be more innovative in general. And so age is just another one of those yep. opportunities to get more ideas around your table for any, any, any organization that's trying to be smart about it. So I, I've got one more question here from Tamika that I want to throw out and then throw it back to you in just a second, uh, Reshma. But Tamika okay. asks, um, so speakers, it seems like there are more and more opportunities in digital media 
how do we encourage emerging female journalists to get on the ball with digital media? Hmm. Um, I, that's an interesting question, uh, Tamika. I think it goes back to um, taking risks and kind of um, understanding that this is the way of, of where media is going. Like digital is is the way of media. Legacy media is trying to incorporate more digital into its operations, but digital is leading a lot of these companies now. And so um, I would say emerging journalists or um, emerging professionals should not be afraid of digital. They are, um, most of them are digital native. You know, this is they have, they live digital lifestyles, and so working for a digital company or or a startup or starting their own thing should not be something that they are afraid to do. Um, learning, taking trainings, learning the skills. Um, I'm a firm believer in investing in your own um, in your own skill set instead of waiting for somebody to pay for it, if you can do it yourself. There's a lot of online training you could do, particularly if you can't visit or go to uh, training elsewhere, but do not be afraid to jump in. I guess I'm, my, my, my real advice is just go ahead and dive in, do it, learn it, perfect it, um, get better at it, and then excel at it. There's no, there should be no fear there. So, um, Reshma, I'm going to throw this back to you. you uh, sure. I know you had a lot of other questions, and there are yeah, also I have a few more questions that, in the this chat. Is actually, this is one of my um, uh, favorite topics to talk about, actually. So there's a saying that says, if she can see it, she can be it. And it's actually the motto of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Mm -hmm. And according to the Institute, in any form of media, the audience needs to see themselves on the screen or on the mm -hmm. page to consider that a possibility. So I'm going to get to the question for uh, Amy and Myra in a second. I just want to say, in my experience, um, I have obviously, as a, a young-ish Indian woman, um, I haven't seen a lot of representation um, in my earlier career of young Indians um, in on television and movies, etc. Um, so I want to ask you guys in your own life, how has seeing a role model do what you dreamed of doing affected your career path? Amy, let's start with you. This, this career path didn't exist when I was growing up, <laughs> nor did anyone with a shaved head. I think I got made <laughs> from the punk rock era. I really was obsessed with my sister shaving her head and sneaking off to the city. I mean, I don't know. I, I definitely think I, I grew up from watching. The, the, I, I know that what I watched on television has definitely shaped me. And it scares me, actually, the more I, I grow to learn that um, as I'm getting older. So I, I definitely saw people that might have been the color of my skin, but I did not grow up with any money. And I grew up idolizing women that were telling me I should be over sexualized and I should look a certain way and, and a certain shape. So I, I never felt that I fit in. Um, I was always fighting another arena of who I should be based on the, the women that were shown to me that even if they, yeah. they looked like me. Um, and I, I didn't think I really knew that until I was old enough to, to look back and then start to get educated about and really understand like, wait, why am I like this? Or why do I fear that? And I could, I could actually trace a lot of it back to what I watched. I grew up on TV. Yeah. Um, so I, I could easily trace it back to that. Myra, that, uh, what do you think? Um, you know, you've been at Ebony, Newsday, CNN. Has seeing role models or being a role model for other women of color shifted the expectations and created opportunities? Um, you know, when I was uh, a young girl growing up, I did not aspire to be a journalist. I did not aspire to be in media because I did not see myself in TV. Um, you know, when you're reading the paper, you don't know the byline, so you can't tell who is, who is what. But I really didn't um, think about getting into journalism until I got into college. Um, and even then, there were a few black women on TV and TV news that I could see or model myself after. No one in my family was a journalist, so you know I couldn't. I could, 
I didn't have those role models within my family. So I kind of um, learned as I grew, you know, and observed. I learned by observing and reading. Um, and that became, and, and then I sought to find women who were doing this. And I came upon them eventually. So, you know, uh, Charlene Hunter Gulf or um, a Carol Simpson, you know, those became the people that I saw on TV. And then as I began to, to grow and widen my network, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be able to tell who was working at magazines or newspapers. And so that became important to me as I got older. But as a young woman, I didn't see myself and didn't realize that this was a career path that I should even pursue. Um, the last part of your question is, so I, that's why I feel role modeling is so important. Exactly. Me and mentoring is so important to me because I didn't have those mentors early on in my career. And so um, this is something I'm really passionate about, making sure I'm accessible and I can um, be the shoulder to lean on, to be the person to vent to, uh, to be the person to give advice based on my collective experience across these various platforms. I think it's so important that we support each other mm -hmm. and that we can reach um, across the aisle, the, the phone, the digital, you know, whatever, that we can reach out to each other and not be afraid to, to lend that support. Because in this day and age, it's hard to be a woman in media just with all the pressures that are happening in, in, the, in the context of our country right now. It's a difficult, it's a, it's a difficult um um, situation, right, with the tensions and everything that we're talking about. So the more support, the better, and, and that's what I hope to model moving forward. Yeah, and Mara, that, that's so, um, that's such a great answer. I just wanted to say also about the mentorship and how important it is, because I think I could ask all three of you, have you ever had a manager who looked like you? I can say 100%, I've never reported to uh, a South Asian female at any point in my career? Uh, the answer to that, um, no. I've never, I can never say I, ha I directly reported to another woman. I have worked for um, women. No, I can take that back. Uh, I, I've directly reported to another Black woman. No. Yeah. Amy? I mean, I actually had gotten, it was luck, because to Tamir's point, I didn't know what I was seeking out. I knew I wanted to work in TV, but I got kicked. My first job was at Rosie O'Donnell. So early on, I started to see women in leadership seats, and I went from that to Oxygen, where Jerry Laybourne was there. Um, and then I went to MTV, where Judy McGrath was leading. I didn't have direct access to these women, but they were, to, you know, I got to start to see them, the ones that were normally behind the scenes, and I, and I think... Whether I was looking at it, mentorship was not a thing, but you, you start to take it in. So Were your direct managers? Uh, my direct manager at Rosie was a female. And I think Rosie did a very good job. She was one of the very early ones who really fought for um, more equal pay in, in what we were doing. She was the first person to give talk shows the summer paid off, which was obvious for moms especially. Normally they would cut you off in June. You wouldn't get paid all summer. You needed other yeah. jobs. Rosie yeah. was the first person to put in your pay. Um, so that she had a large, she had a large female staff, and um, I, so I did. And I want to qualify. I mean, I worked at Ebony, so that's an all-black company, right? <laughs> so I, I'm talking about like in mainstream media. Exactly. I've never worked uh, or had a boss who was an African American woman. Me neither. No, I, I, I actually, um, for most of my career, I mean, I've always worked in sort of like, like Myra, I, I've always worked in, in organizations that were predominantly female. So for me to have a, a female boss was not mm -hmm. unusual, but, uh, but I will say that for most of my career, I have reported to boards of directors. Mm -hmm. So I have had, mm -hmm. and, and in fact, boards of directors that intentionally alternated male, female, male, female, male, female, and that have had a lot of um, placed a high priority on diversity. So I feel like I've been extremely lucky in that regard, and um, and that it, it 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 does make it makes a huge huge difference. It's it's 
it's seeing, seeing, being able to see yourself in whatever, whatever is out there, but also being able to have the opportunity to, to see a wide variety of people for me has been a hugely enriching thing. Um, I'm cognizant of the time. We have a couple of questions that we always ask people at the end, and I want to be sure that we do those, but I also see a very important comment from Ellen, and I'm going to just take it as a comment and, and as a challenge to Myra and to Amy in particular, and to Reshma, all three of you. This is a challenge for all of you because Ellen, I get it. I've been there. I know exactly what you're talking about. So here's her comment. Every year for 63 years, the UN hosts the Commission on the Status of Women. It never gets any coverage. Do you know about it? And if not, what can you do to cover it? 4,000 plus women from all over the world attend to share best practices in the empowerment of girls and women. Um, I'm actually going to be involved with two presentations at the Commission on the Status of Women this year. And I was just talking to the person who's, who organized them yesterday and I'm like, you know, this is what's gonna happen. So don't get all super excited. So <laughs> that's the challenge, that's the challenge, you guys. We, th there are stories there, there are really great stories and we can talk about that after this is over with. But before we get in, without, without having the time to get into a great discussion of that, our closing question for each of you is, how can people find you if they want to find out more about you and your organization? And what's the one big takeaway you want people to get from, what, from the wisdom that you have acquired over the years? So, uh, Myra, how about you? Um, so I am... Um, on most social media sites, um, Myra Lowe, M-I-R-A-L-O-W-E on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, those are the two probably social uh, networks that you can reach out to me um, pretty readily. Um, you know, my I guess the biggest takeaway I can say just based on my experience is um, back going back to something that I've said about, you know, Striving to to strive for progress, not for perfection. Mm. Yes, right. Progress, not for perfection. Right, because I think perfection slows us down. We get caught up in our heads. We get caught up in trying to be just right. But as long as we are moving forward and we're moving forward with intention and we're moving forward. Um, with expectation of good things to come, I think that's where I would I would like to encourage um, my sisters out there in the universe to really not to be afraid to to take chances and to move forward and to keep putting one step in front of the other. Cool, Amy. How can people find you and and uh, what's the big takeaway? First, Mira, I love progress, not perfection. We have a VP of programming here who lives by that and taught that to me <laughs> years ago. And I still say it. And it's like literally burned in all of our mm -hmm. memories. So I love that. Um, I think I'm Amy Emrick almost everywhere. I might be Emmer Schmidt at Twitter. I, I'm on LinkedIn. I live on every social site. My I'm Instagram is basically like I don't even attempt to try to be inspirational on there because I got no time. <laughs> but feel free to DM me. Um, and I think just, you know, I love wearing really like feminist t-shirts and just the ones that say girls support each other. And, you know, Mary, you mentioned this, just supporting one another. And that comes in all easy ways. Um, just following people on Instagram is even just kind of like part of the protest and like really instead of women have been taught to judge one another and to try to retrain us to constantly support one another of all kind, um, I think is really important. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, uh, Reshma, how can people find you? Um, you found me right here. Um, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Reshing Bull or Instagram uh, at Reshma Go. Um, I'm also, like Amy said, like I'm on every single platform. You can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Just get, get me there. You can fax me. I don't know where that is. Whoa. I know. That's old school, Reshma. Old school. Wait, Gloria, do we have one more uh, question? Like, we, time for one more question? We actually are at the 730 mark. Is there okay, well, it's the go-to go song it. question. Okay, all right. Okay, well, let's all do right. it. If everybody can Amy. stay another minute, we'll do it. Amy, uh, what is your go-to song or quote that keeps you going? Oh, God. I'm so bad with music. <laughs> or a quote. A quote could work, too. Um, 
because I have two kids that are five and four. All I do is watch Disney. <laughs> so right now I'm trying to get them to listen to Beyonce. It's not working. It's and not all working. I'm listening is to Moana. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, so any song from that soundtrack kind of works for me right now. Okay. Myra, how about you? Uh, my go-to quote is, is by Nelson Mandela, uh, with everything on our plates that he likes, to, he's, uh, well, he's credited with saying, it may, you know, with, with social media, you never know who really said it first, but it, um, uh, it always seems impossible until it's done. That's, that's a great one. That's, that's a, a way better answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like songs from Moana, too. <laughs> I like well, that soundtrack, too. Thanks, ladies. <laughs> See, that was really good support. Good yeah. example right there. <laughs> women supporting women. <laughs> Exactly. You're exactly. So I uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Gloria. I'm so happy to thank be here. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, thank you for having us. By the way, you. I'm always Gloria Felt on social media because otherwise I would forget what I said. <laughs> and uh, and take the lead is take lead women on Twitter and take the lead women everywhere else. And um, we're so grateful to everybody for joining us. I hope you all downloaded the the two um, freebies that we had for you tonight and. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts at any time. And I believe that is a wrap. Thank awesome. you. Thanks for joining Take the Lead Presents Virtual Happy Hour. Be sure to tune in again next month. Remember, it's the second Wednesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. One hour, once a month, to boost your career. Until then, power to you.